My name is, is Lee, Lee Hodder, and as the, the introducer said, I, I cover both sustainability and strategy for GELP. And I really wanted just to, to reinforce part of why my role exists in the way it does is because I fully agree that going forward, companies, especially in the energy sector, we can't actually have a strategy unless it's sustainable. Um, and so again, I, I'll talk a bit more later on today. Um, but, but for me, this type of event is just critical. The more and more I see this, and I'm fourth generation oil and gas by background, to, to be open, so I've, my family have, have seen how the industry have, have changed over the last few decades. For me, this is all about setting a new way to collaborate in, in the sector. Um, I'm partnering with sometimes typical competitors, but also new people within the value chains that we're still trying to develop. So again, my, my plea really today is to just let, let's be open-minded, let, let's challenge each other. I'll, I'll share some of the challenges that I think a company like Galp are facing, um, but again, really open to, to be challenged as part of the round table as well. So, so with that, I'll, I'll keep it short and I'll hand it over to our, our first presenter. Thank you. Dr. Kenza Taufik, ex-SBTI expert. Thank you very much for the invitation today. Um, as uh, mentioned, I am uh, Kenza Taufik. I'm part of CDP's Commit to Action team and the SBTI corporate engagement team, uh, especially responsible for the Europe European region. And I'm very happy to uh, virtually be with you today. Um, although I would have enjoyed it uh, in person as Portugal uh, holds a special place in my heart. But that's not the topic for today. Um, the topic is uh, net zero science-based target setting and I'll provide you with an overview of what it means to set net zero targets that are aligned with climate science. And to reach that goal, uh, we'll start with a short introduction to the initiative and define science-based targets and then delve into the net zero standard. So without further ado, um, the SPTI is a global body that was formed in 2015 as a collaboration between four partner organizations, uh, CDP, the UNGC, um, WRI and WWF. And it was launched just before the Paris Agreement. And um, at that point, it was unclear for companies how they would translate um, global climate goals into something that they could implement themselves. So. The goal of the SPTI is to enable companies to set emissions reductions targets that are in line with the latest climate science so that we can avoid the most catastrophic impact of climate change. Um, so as you can see on the slide, uh, the initiative has had very strong traction with now more than 3000 companies in total having joined uh, the SPTI and more than a thousand companies have committed to align their reductions with a 1.5 degree pathway, which helps to set companies on um, the trajectory to net zero emissions. So what is a science-based target or SBT as we call them? They are corporate emissions reductions targets which are in line with the level of decarbonization which the latest climate science says is necessary to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. So to put it in simple terms, um, SBTs help companies determine how much and how fast they need to reduce their emissions to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And um, when looking at the time frame of um, near-term science-based targets, they span five to 10 years. And this uh, really means that they are the stepping stones that companies need to take on the, long, uh, on the way to the long-term goal of um, net zero. And having a shorter time frame helps to provide accountability, but also drive more immediate action in the coming decade. So why do companies set science-based targets? What are the business drivers behind? Um, it is firstly to seize and take advantage of uh, opportunities within the low carbon transition, for example, by innovating on the development of um, low carbon products or services. It is also to anticipate regulatory and policy development. We are seeing more uh, and more ambitious national climate targets being announced. And over time, these will become the norm. So by setting a science-based target, um, companies can stay ahead of the curve on regulation and mitigate transition risks. Additionally, there is inherent competitiveness behind the low carbon transition, for example, um, minimizing energy or emissions related costs. 
And uh, finally, and probably uh, more importantly, uh, it is to address expectations from stakeholders, including customers and investors who are expecting um, companies to have these kind of robust targets in place in order to future-proof their business for the low-carbon transition. So uh, let's uh, take a look at the process that companies can expect to follow by joining the Science-Based Target Initiative and what the key milestones are along this journey. Um, so the first step is the commitment, and this is where a company commits to set a science-based target by signing a commitment letter. And the SBTI encourages all companies to commit to the highest level of ambition, which is to set not only short-term targets, but also long-term targets to reach net zero by 2050. Um, companies which uh, make a net zero commitment automatically enter the uh, UNFCCC Race to Zero campaign. And all companies are welcome, um, inclu including SMEs, uh, who also are encouraged to join the SBTI, um, and, and there is a dedicated route for them. So uh, once a company commits, uh, this kicks off a 24-month period where they have publicly demonstrated their intention to set a science-based target. And within that time frame, the company uh, needs to model um, and develop the target and very crucially then submit them for um, validation by the SBTI. And this is a key differentiating feature um, of the SBTI compared with other uh, commitment initiatives as under the SBTI's model, a company will have its uh, targets assessed by a team of technical analysts to make sure that it meets the, the, the strict criteria. Um, once the target is validated, assuming that it is approved by the SBTI, this will be reflected on um, the SBTI's website and uh, the details of the target itself will be published, um, helping to provide more transparency to stakeholders. So at this point, uh, this is where the real work starts as companies need to implement actions to reduce um, emissions and importantly uh, to highlight here, companies must disclose the progress against the science-based target on an annual basis. So let's um, delve into the net zero standard now. And uh, firstly, um, you might wonder why did the SBTI go through the process of developing the new uh, net zero standard? So for about two years, the initiative has been working on defining net zero as a concept and developing a framework that uh, would provide the necessary criteria and practical guidance to be able to set net zero targets. And that's because there was no consistent global standard for companies to set um, net zero targets, despite the increasing numbers of companies that have announced their net zero pledges. So there was and still is a lot of divergence between uh, the types of net zero targets that were being announced. And because of this, um, the SBTI released the first global net zero standard, which uh, now provides much needed clarity and credibility to net zero claims amidst the current confusion and accusations of uh, greenwashing in the corporate net zero landscape. Um, the development of the framework, which began in September 2020, um, followed a thorough, transparent and uh, inclusive process an expert advisory group with uh, representatives from the corporate space, academia, civil society, um, and uh, science was set up. And once the criteria and guidance were drafted, the initiative engaged over 800 stakeholders to test those resources. The standard was then launched in Q4 of last year. And since uh, January this year, companies are able to have their net zero targets validated by the initiative. So let's look at um, the reasons um, uh, net zero as a concept was highly criticized. Um, and it was because uh, we have seen a huge increase of net zero pledges, but there were many, many, many um, differences uh, across, and those differences we summarized um, in four 
main dimensions. So the first dimension is that the net zero pledges um, differed across climate scope. So you would have some companies um, that would uh, only include carbon dioxide in their targets, while others would include all greenhouse gases, for example. The second dimension um, is the scope of activities that are covered by the targets. So some targets would include uh, only a company's own operations, while others would uh, include all of their value chain. The third dimension where uh, the SBTI saw differences uh, is the mitigation strategy used to reach net zero. So some companies just focused on emissions reductions, others were looking at uh, avoided emissions or even negative emissions such as um, offsetting. And the fourth, uh, the fourth um, dimension was time frame. So some companies announced very short term um, pledges, uh, some being 2020 even, while others uh, had 2060 as um, a target, uh, which is way beyond the 2050 milestone, which should all be looking at. So there was a huge vari a variety and a lack of um, understanding of uh, when is the right time to be setting a net zero target. Um, and because of these uh, variations, there has been a lot of criticism to net zero as a concept. And some of this criticism has been around the incomplete boundary and uh, the net zero tri uh, standards is trying to address this by including all of a uh, company's value chain emissions within the target. The second criticism is that um, net zero targets can be used as an excuse to delay action. And the standard includes near-term targets, which ensures um, short-term action. The third uh, point uh, is that targets can be used as a deterrent on actual mitigation of emissions. Some companies would focus only on offsetting rather than reducing their own emissions. And um, the net zero standard puts strong uh, guardrails for companies to be reducing their emissions at the right speed to be able to get us to net zero by 2050. And finally, the lack of uh, accountability has also called, uh, caused the criticism and the standard tries to address this through the validation of net zero targets, but also uh, the SBTI does require companies to report on their uh, emissions on an annual basis. So um, let's look at uh, the net zero standard itself. And there are four key elements that make up uh, the, this framework. The first one is to set a near-term science-based target. And this is what um, companies that are familiar with this for the past uh, uh, years um, know as their regular science-based target. Uh, so this is what has been validated by the SBTI over the five uh, last years. And these are five to 10 year greenhouse gas mitigation targets that are in line with 1.5 degree pathways. So here the SBTI just added the term near term to make a distinction from the next element, which is to set a long-term science-based target. So this is the new science-based target that has been uh, the work of the SBTI over the, the, the last several months to help companies determine how much they need to reduce emissions to be in line with global net zero scenarios that limit um, global warming to 1.5 degrees. So these targets also need to be aligned with 1.5 degrees and be, um, must be achieved no later uh, than 2050. And for most companies, this actually will require them to reduce their emissions by 90% or more. Then we have the third element, which is not a requirement, but a recommendation from the initiative, um, because uh, the initiative feels that companies in the transition to net zero should take action outside and beyond their science-based targets to mitigate emissions. So uh, these would be investments outside of their own value chain to support society move toward um, the goal of net zero. And they would come on top of the science-based target and cannot replace the need for emissions reductions. This is basically a new term for what you used to be called compensation. 
And finally, the last element of the standard is that companies uh, have to neutralize any uh, residual emissions that remain when they reach their long-term science-based targets. So for most companies, this uh, will represent about 10%. Um, and on this diagram, uh, this is represented by the light blue diamond. In the example, you can see that the company does have residual emissions left and will have to balance uh, them out with permanent carbon removal and storage. So when um, a company wants to set a science-based target under the net zero uh, standard for both near-term and long-term targets, there are four key considerations that should be taken into account. The first one is the time frame. So as we saw, near-term science-based target need to cover five to 10 year, um, a five to 10 year period, whereas a long-term targets will need to be achieved by 2050, the latest. And here there is an exception, which is the power generation sector that uh, has to reach this long-term science-based target by 2040, the latest. The second element is the level of ambition. So the temperature uh, alignment and for near-term targets, um, Scope one and two need to be 1.5 degree aligned, while scope three in the short term uh, needs to be well below two degree aligned. However, in the long run, all scopes will have to be 1.5 degree aligned. The third consideration is the boundary criterion. So basically the share of emissions that must be covered by a target. Um, for the near term, companies must include 95% of their scope one and two emissions. Uh, and if scope three represent 40% or more of the total emissions, then the target must cover 67% of the scope three emissions. For the long-term targets, um, scope one and two is still 95%. However, for scope three, uh, SBTI goes a step further and asks companies to cover 90% of the emissions. Um, finally, there are several methods to calculate and set targets, uh, some which apply to all scopes, some which uh, only apply to scope three, and these methods are explained in the various resources provided by the SBTI um, to companies. Um, just wanted to go back to um, the scope three approach uh, that the SBTI is taking, um, and it is that over time, the company's target boundary would increase. We saw that in the near term, the target needs to cover 67%, and this is going to increase to um, 90% for the long uh, run. And the reason for this is that throughout the development of the standard, it was clear that a comprehensive target was going to be necessary for companies to be able to make a credible net zero claim. Companies need to include the vast majority of their emissions. Um, the initiative does, however, recognize that there are challenges around scope three, for example, data collection, changing supply chains, calculation issues. So this approach is followed to give companies more time to work through the complexity of scope three. So in the short term, companies can focus on the most material emissions. And over time, they would look at the entire value chain and collaborate as well with both suppliers and customers to decarbonize. Um, when developing the standard, the SBTI had the mitig mitigation hierarchy in mind, and basically it means that companies should focus their climate action on abatement as a priority. Um, in other words, it means to reduce emissions within their own value chain. The um, next element companies should be uh, looking at is going beyond their science-based target to look at all of the other actions that they could take to mitigate emissions that occur outside of their value chains. And finally, a company should start thinking about the neutralization action, um, actions to, that would help them balance any remaining emissions when it reaches the long-term target. Um, unfortunately, what has been common practice uh, with net zero target is that companies would focus purely on uh, beyond value chain mitigation, so um, offsetting, without thinking about abatement or neutralization. Um, just a few words to say that the SBTI has pl is planning three projects to help tackle so some of the challenges that are linked to net zero. The first one is beyond value chain mitigation. This is a very fast evolving landscape and the SBTI will continue uh, its work on that to provide further guidance on neutralization and beyond value chain mitigation. 
The next project is the Net Zero Value Chains project. This is trying to address some of the challenges around scope three. So the initiative is looking at a temperature alignment for scope three, trying to answer key questions um, on value chain intervention, like in setting, for example. Um, and finally, there is the uh, measurement reporting and verification project um, that the SBTI is working on. So developing a framework which uh, will aim to provide a standardized and more robust mechanism to, to track organizations' progress against their targets. Um, just to say, there are many uh, guidance documents that are available on um, the website. These are the four main resources for um, developing net zero targets. And we also have uh, a wide variety of, resor of resources that would help companies that are also starting their journey when it comes to target um, setting in general. To close, I'd like to invite um, all Portuguese companies uh, attending today to join global leaders and uh, commit to the necessary level of ambition by setting science-based net zero targets. And many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Kenza. We will now hear from Mr. Rob Fowler. ISO TC322 on sustainable finance expert. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi. Good afternoon. My name's Rob Fowler. Um, I've come here all the way from Australia. So it's been quite a long journey to get here and tomorrow I fly back. Um, I've been working in climate change and sustainable finance for about 20 years now. For the early part of that journey, no one really knew what I was talking about. Didn't take much notice, which was a little bit frustrating, I have to say. But these days, it's quite a different situation. Quite a different situation. About seven years ago, I started working with investors. And they are an incredibly powerful group in this world we live in. Quite extraordinary, the power they wield. And their journey on climate change and having a greener future has been really quite interesting and quite fast. Now, this conference here is about ESG, environment, social and governance. But there's also the topic of sustainable finance. And these things are often mixed up. Um, I see them as two sides of the same coin but they're quite different. And this is a familiar coin, I hope, for some of the uh, people in the audience. Um, <clears throat> ESG is a really interesting concept, and it's a concept that is flooding around the world. How does it work? What does it mean? It's really a risk management tool. It's a way to expand your perspective on risk from just financial aspects to the broader aspects of a business operations or its assets. Environment risks, social risks with labor or communities, and governance risks if governance systems fail. So investors are looking at ESG as an, another way to review and understand the risks associated with their investments. On the other side of that coin is sustainable finance. This is about the impact, hopefully positive, the positive impact of investments. What do these things do on the ground? How do they change things? What sort of credentials do they have from a green or sustainability perspective? So the same investments, but looking at them in two quite different ways. So I've been working a lot in the green bond market. Now the bond market is not very well known around the world, but it is incredibly large and powerful. It's the largest of our capital markets everywhere. And every day, every 24 hours, around one trillion US dollars is transacted in the bond market. One trillion every day. That's an extraordinary amount of money. And most of it is done by low risk, long term investors. They decided a while ago that if you have a long term vision and you believe climate change is going to be a problem, then you're sort of at, at the front line. If you've got a 20 year investment horizon, say as a pension fund or an insurance fund, 20 years down the road, climate change is a big deal. And so a lot of those investors started to look for a way to get some immunity, to vaccinate some of their investments from climates. 
And so they asked to have some things labelled, some bonds labelled as green. And that meant that the money that was being raised was equivalent to the green stuff that that company had. So the investor could say, yes, I'm putting money into this bond. It's the same kind of bond I normally invest in, but that money is aligned with green assets. Give them some immunity from a future where climate change is a problem. As you can see, in 2003, 28 billion, eh, not much money. <laughs> As you can see, last year, it's grown. And last year, about 20% of European bonds were labelled somehow. 20%. In three years' time, what will that figure be? But we're seeing an incredible growth here. And the growth is important not just because of the size, but because of the diversification. Investors need diversification in their portfolios. It's a fundamental part of being a good investor. And so having lots of different types of bonds, lots of different types of issuers, corporates, governments, municipalities, lots of different flavours and positions on the yield curve are really important for this market to evolve and expand. We've also seen some different types of investments. You can see green bonds at the bottom there, should be coloured green probably. Um, that has grown dramatically, but it's still the majority of what's happening. But we have some other instruments that are coming along. Loans, of course, much more traditional approach to financing as bonds. And we're seeing sustainability as a broader picture, not just the environment, but the broader picture of sustainability. And what we're seeing now is a pretty amazing growth in this market. We have the green environmental focus there, which is coloured green now, and that's an important focus and a lot of people, that resonates. They can sort of understand what it means. There's also the subset of climate within the green picture. And then there's blue about oceans and water, and of course, transition. Not everyone's green right now, no way. So how do we guide, how do you acknowledge that kind of investment as well as a green investment, but different? And then we look on the social side, all these different aspects of our social lives. And governments and companies have been raising money for this stuff. We saw a lot of governments raising money for pandemic relief. It became a huge social effort over the last couple of years. But we also see this type of money going into microfinance, tiny little loans to help people come out of poverty. Education, health, all those things have social impact. And so investors are starting to associate what their money's doing on the ground with their investment decisions. And that's a huge step. If you bang those two things together, green and social, you get sustainable. That's really how it works. And of course, we have the, social, the sustainable development goals, which are sort of overriding global journey, which is, a, again, a complex place. In terms of what you could invest in, if you want to buy some sort of green investment, it doesn't have to be a bond. There's all sorts of different types of investments you can make. Whether those acronyms mean anything to you is another question. <laughs> a bond is something that is a, a fixed term investment, usually low risk. Get the same interest rate for however many years, then you get the money back. Quite simple. A loan is something we're probably more familiar with. We get a loan from a bank or you get a loan from a bigger consortium of banks if you're a big player. A sukuk is an Islamic finance instrument. So shifting money around in the Islamic world where interest is not allowed. Interesting structures to get that to happen. ABS, RMBS, these things are structures that people have created in the capital markets to try and put money into smaller assets. So for example, if I have a whole bunch of car loans, I can wrap that up into a securitized structure and get funding from the capital markets to do that. So this is a way to bring large scale money down into small assets. And that's important for the green transition. We need a whole bunch of electric scooters out there in Indonesia, in India, in China. We need a whole bunch of green houses. So funding those things with cheaper large scale finance is very important. That's what, the, that's what those structures do. And of course, above that, we have funds and exchange traded funds and indices. The whole investment ecosystem is now resonating with this green thing. It's quite remarkable, quite a big change. Now, there are two main ways that people are raising money in this space. The first one is to say, here's a bunch of green assets. I'm just going to stick with the green theme for now, if that's OK. Here's a bunch of green assets. I want to raise a billion dollars, and I've got more than a billion of green assets. 
great. I'm going to label my bond as green. I'm going to tie that all together with some documentation and an external review. Someone verifies it. Away we go. There's also another structure which is emerging, particularly in the heavy emitting sectors, fossil fuels, cement, steel, all those places, where instead of having a lot of green assets, which they often don't, they make a promise to do something greener. And they attach that to the funding and say, look, if I don't meet my promise, then I'll, you can charge me a bit more interest. But that's a structure which is getting some resistance. It's a structure which has become popular because it means you can raise lots of money, but not necessarily invest that in green stuff. But the reality of that is not sitting well with investors. They want their money to do the work. They don't just want to invest in companies that say they're going to do a little bit better. So there's a tension happening right now with these new types of linked instruments. I'm not going to focus on them very much for the rest of this talk, if that's okay. What is really important when you do have a green bond is that the investor all the way up the top of the value chain can sort of see that the proportion of their money that's in that investment goes all the way down to something that's green. That line of sight from investors all the way down is a really important feature of how this is working. That's why they keep buying them. They can put it in their portfolio and call it green. They can pass it up to another person who can also call it green as if it's in their portfolio. So it's a powerful approach, but it really needs some detail on what is green enough. What can you call green? It's a tricky one. And investors don't know anything about it. <laughs> Absolutely not. And investors are usually pretty cautious, conservative. So if they need to step into something that they don't understand, they want someone else to put their skin in the game or someone else to say, yes, that's green enough or some outside force that they can point to because they don't trust themselves if they don't know what they're doing. So what's happened now so far over the last five or six years is we have a pretty consistent structure for this sort of capital raising. You need to put a document together, lay out how you're going to do it, what your green assets are, how you've selected them, how you're going to manage the money, what's the reporting arrangement. That sort of set structure of information disclosure is something investors now expect all around the world. If you want to raise a green bond, you need a green bond framework document. And I help people write these. Um, this is sort of small industry of people writing them. Usually it's the investment banks who are helping you raise the money who will help you write this document. But it is a journey that a company or government needs to go through. I've just finished up work with the Austrian government, been working with the Treasury there to help them raise money. They'll be issuing a green bond for probably three or four billion euro next week. They've gone through a journey to say, okay, out of our budget, what's green enough? What can we put in this green portfolio and not get in, into trouble? <laughs> That's tricky. And so the actual process of figuring out internally what's green enough is a really healthy step. And because it's driven by the financial part of the organization, it gets done really fast. <laughs> Absolutely. CFO says do this, okie dokie. But what's green enough? It's a tricky thing to figure out. And so what has been done is people are putting together these things called taxonomies. Now, taxonomy is a word that we've seen in science. It's a way that we figure out how species work together and how they are different or similar and those sorts of things. And so it's a familiar word for a lot of people who've gone down that road. But not long ago, a good friend of mine, Sean, <laughs> Sean Kidney, he decided a taxonomy was a great thing for green investment. And that was mostly because he was running a show which was trying to track green bonds. And so if it was going to be green enough to be in their list, why? And so they started to lay out this justification. Okay, this is green, this is not. And so they created a fairly simple approach. That has now been replicated around the world, in particular in Europe. It's probably the most famous of the taxonomies out there. But the challenge is creating something that's a useful tool, but not too complex. Because there's a barrier to getting involved in this. And companies that join the UN Compact, companies that commit under SBTI, there's a journey there you have to go down. And if it makes it too hard, you get a lot of pushback. So there's a, a, a balance you need to strike in creating these things. Now, what are they used for? A taxonomy can be quite powerful, and you can use it like they are in Europe in everything. It's about how you decide if a bond is green enough and label it. It's about reporting every year what you're doing to increase your proportion of what's good enough to be green and called aligned. So the taxonomy is something that can be very useful across the financial services world. 
but it can also be challenging. And it's not something that's static. It's dynamic. It's changing over time because we're figuring out what could be better, what should stop soon, <laughs> those things. And we're trying to figure out what new things are coming in because all the solutions we need to change this, to solve this challenge are not here yet. Most of them are, so don't be fooled by that, but there are still new ones to come. What's the next one? So a group that I worked with for a long time is called the Climate Bonds Initiative. Started out a small NGO, still pretty small, similar to the SBTI story. These guys started a bit earlier and have created this sort of approach that investors are now very happy with. They took the investor's side in this journey. And so CBI tried to create tools and rules and standards so investors had more confidence in investing in green things. And it's worked pretty well. This document here, 16 pages, color-coded, it's lovely. <laughs> and it lays out very clearly what's green enough and what's not, or what you need to dive into further to understand. Use a traffic light system, red, not, not good enough, green, pretty good, amber, more detail required. And so it goes into that detail at a certain level. Investors often have this printed on their desk and mm, flip through, that one looks good. So it's a useful tool for many. What then happened was China decided this was a good idea. I remember going to China a lot in the year before they released this. And you could see it's a government document. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> but more detail, you know, a lot of pages, a lot of technical detail, but still very easy to use. One dimension, what's green enough and what's not. We then had the European journey where they decided they didn't just want to tackle climate or anything. They wanted to have six different environmental objectives all at once, and then a whole bunch of different layers on how you can get through. Are you green enough? Are you transition? Are you enabling? And then are you damaging all the other things? If you're leading on climate with this investment, what about all the other environmental things? We need to make sure you're not harming those. And so the complexity associated with this system is, is pretty mind blowing, but people are getting through it and the reporting requirements are real. If you don't meet them, you're in trouble. So this is the sort of thing that Europe is doing, using this taxonomy tool for lots of different things. And their broader objective is to have more and more assets, operations, businesses, governments that are aligned with this green stuff, a sustainable approach. Now everyone wants one. <laughs> yeah, and, and my old colleagues at CBI, uh, my old friend Bridget, who's living in Australia at the moment, but soon to be in another place. She's managing 21 different countries who are trying to make a taxonomy for themselves because they know that there needs to be international consistency. That's what investors have asked for, but not everyone's Europe. And so all the details in the European one just don't make any sense for most other countries in the world. So everyone's starting a little bit afresh, trying to get consistency, global consistency and local relevance. That's the journey most people are on. And once they do have a taxonomy, it will hopefully help the money to flow. That's really the journey we want. I'm gonna finish with this one, I think. I'm not sure, not too many left, but I think we're a bit over time. Um, this whole labeling of investments is a bit weird and new. What's important to understand is that most, or if not all of these investments from a contracting and credit and legal perspective, are the same as the unlabeled versions. So if I buy a green bond, the legals and the contracting, exactly the same. There's a little layer on top, which is the label. And that's important because these investors have very strict rules and they're really boring people who just wanna do their job and just get this stuff done. So complexity and change is not their friend. So we have to somehow get them to do something without changing too much. And so having a label on top of an existing legal structure has been very powerful. And so an investor can sit with a decision and say, I've got this, this deal or this deal, one's green, one's not, exactly the same credit, exactly the same duration, exactly the same risk, why not choose the green one? And that simple choice has driven that huge uptick in volumes. So the investors like it. They get to do what they're doing all the time. They get a bit of green flavor in their portfolios. They meet the targets that have been set by above and they're happy to do that. On the issuer or borrower side, the company or the government that's getting that money, it's an interesting process they have to go through. What is green enough and my stuff? 
and most companies who issue the first green bond, the treasurer is so happy with the way it went because raising money is hard. And if it's green and you've got lots of investors, it's easy. So that journey of actually raising money becomes a thing. And so the treasurer says, okay, we've got this capital plan. How much of it's green? 10%? What? Should be more. That discussion. Where are the other green assets in our government portfolio, which is an interesting journey for many governments? Why is that not green? It should be. And that little change, that little push is really quite powerful because investors basically control the world. It's really hard to get beyond it. If they turn off the money, it gets pretty crazy. <laughs> so I'll leave you with this last thought. I did some work with WWF last year, which is great fun. The panda's awesome. Um, we did a, a report that says debt capital markets can save the planet. Actually, it was a good question. Can debt capital markets save the planet? And the answer was not very clear, <laughs> but there's a whole lot of levers that can be pulled for central banks, for regulators, for standard setters, like the ISO group that I'm dancing with this week. Many others can pull levers that they have control of to make a big shift, but that shift has to go a bit further yet. <laughs> you can see here, the fossil fuel industry is still very well funded. And at the moment, it's funding itself. There's got so much cash, it's mind blowing. How much cash is being pulled out of everybody who's paying more for fuel and gas and electricity and going to those energy companies? Will they use it to change faster? Maybe. Is it profitable to do that? Right now, no. So there's an interesting challenge. And it's not just the companies, it's the entities that also help them raise money. And so that's the role of investment banks. And investment banks are very interesting people. I don't know if you know any investment bankers. They're quite different to people who buy bonds. <laughs> quite different. And they love to win. And they love to meet targets and get big bonuses. And so at the moment, we're seeing a really interesting shift in the governance and leadership of those companies if all their money and profits are coming from a facilitating capital for fossil fuels, they're not really helping to save the planet. But if they can shift that, if they can reward their people to do more green stuff, they will do more green stuff, I promise you. Because those people in that part of the financial world are not really concerned about the planet. Absolutely not. So there's a certain guidance journey that needs to happen here. Investors are driving it a lot, but there's also other levers that need to be pulled. Thanks very much.